watched. Um, so this is not exactly the talk I planned to give, um, but it turns out that much of the information I plan to share is more relevant than ever in terms of focusing on that forever transaction, that long-term relationship with the customer, especially in these times and using that as the North Star to guide you in both you know, product design and also in how the business model evolves. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share a little bit of background um, about my point of view, where I'm coming from, and then I'm gonna dive into what it means uh, right now um, and share some hopefully tips and tools that might be useful to you as you're um, you know, pivoting, scaling, you know, dealing with, you know, major changes in terms of your, your customers or your subscribers situations um, and uh, trying to uh, stay ahead in a world where nobody really knows what's going to happen next and where every half day, uh, it seems like the rules uh, have all changed and the facts are all new. So it's a new world. Um, for those of us who are here in the Bay Area, we've been in shelter in place mode for the last six weeks since March 16th. Um, I, for one, have barely put on shoes since then, let alone visited a client or traveled um, to a conference. Uh, that's what my usual life is like. Lots of travel, um, lots of client work. Um, so we're in this new world. And in this world of physical distancing, digital solutions are more important than ever for productivity, for entertainment, for inspiration, and for connection. Um, at the same time, many product features um, are suddenly irrelevant. Um, the ones that help with transportation, hospitality, live events, uh, sports matches, theme parks, business conferences that are held live. Um, and then there's other businesses that still have great value to share, but it needs to be repackaged in the app, um, via app. Uh, you know, restaurants moving to takeout and delivery, um, you know, health devices um, being used remotely now so that the doctor doesn't have to necessarily or the whole team doesn't necessarily have to be in the same room where the ultrasound is happening. Um, so some companies are really uh, pivoting. Uh, fragrance houses are making hand sanitizer. Uh, I just heard uh, from Andy that some uh, spirits companies are also making hand sanitizer, which may or may not taste the same as the... Uh, as the spirits. Um, and we've got, you know, fashion companies uh, like Brooks Brothers making uh, masks and gowns. Um, some businesses, you know, I think something that's important to remember is that some businesses, even as many businesses are tanking and struggling um, and trying to gain their footing, some businesses are spiking. Um, and um, so when we reach out to people, uh, it's hard to know what kind of mood they'll be in. Um, some are dealing with a health crisis. Others have family members on the front lines. Um, some are uh, you know, kind of bored, Netflix and chill with nothing to do. And other people, especially I think here in Silicon Valley and especially in product management and in the venture world, uh, people have never been busier. Um, the demands of you know, new features, um, iterating, changing direction um, is kind of uh, the new normal. Um, the, the bad news is bad. You know, people are losing their jobs, laid off, furloughed. Um, even companies with great valuations, even companies with surpluses, um, even people that have cash reserves are suddenly really pulling back on what they're willing to spend on um, and uh, behaving in a way, I think this is really important, they're behaving unpredictably. It's hard to know what people are gonna do from day to day. One day they don't wanna talk about business, the next thing that's all they wanna talk about. Um, so it's really uh, kind of strange times. Uh, and many of us have been, uh, have been forced to pivot our focus. We've missed major professional milestones. I'm, pretty sure I'm not the only person uh, on this call who has had to scale down a launch uh, or even postpone it uh, as it becomes less of a priority uh, in this time of COVID-19. Um, so, you know, that's the bad part, but, you know, it's important to remember that there's some good stuff too. Um, the first thing that I think is good that we, you know, can keep in mind is that a lot of us are getting a reprieve from quarterly capitalism. Um, you know, for many organizations, you know, the numbers, the, the traditional expectations for business have gone out the window. 
um, which might give us an opportunity to invest more in the long term. If you know you're not going to hit your short term goal, um, there's an opportunity for, for innovation, for creativity, for um, you know, kind of following the North Star of changing customer needs. There's a little bit of a, of a break. Um, times of crisis and constraint on the business side lead to greater creativity. Um, in business school, we did an exercise that showed that people are more creative when they're launching a business with $5 than they are when they're launching a business with either unlimited capital or no capital. There's something about that funny constraint that, you know, fosters uh, new ideas. Ernest Hemingway um, once made a bet with his friends that he could write a story in six words, and he did. Baby shoes for sale, never worn. Uh, some of Shakespeare's best works are sonnets uh, using this very rigid structure of stanzas, lines, rhyming patterns. That actually results in better art. This is a moment for creativity and an opportunity to leapfrog forward um, instead of kind of, you know, moving slowly and deliberately. Um, another thing that I think could be good news is that during times of crisis, people accelerate and intensify relationships. Um, we do that because we have no choice, right? We're scared, we're vulnerable, we don't know what tomorrow's gonna hold for us. So we have no choice but to trust the people around us and the organizations that are taking care of us. So it's a real opportunity right now to invest in building the relationship, both with existing customers or subscribers and also with tomorrow's and yesterday's customers. Um, and the other thing about consumers and customers right now is when people um, are forced to change their habits, that means they need to find new ways and new habits, which means that people are more willing to try new products and services. Um, so this is actually a moment when there's a lot of trial. Um, and it's also a moment when people are willing, mainly because they're forced to, to endure the friction of learning how to do new things. So, you know, a lot of my work is helping uh, old school, large businesses with digital transformation, moving to a direct to customer subscription model um, across all industries. So uh, heavy equipment, uh, retail, consumer products, uh, financial services, uh, and so on. And usually one of the challenges that they complain about is, you know, we're trying to move to this new model. We'd love to show our existing customers that these new features are actually in their best interest, give them more value, more flexible, uh, more content available, uh, all kinds of good, good things, community. Um, but the customer says, I don't want to try that. I like my print newspaper. I like going to the store and touching the clothes or the melons myself and making my own choices. Um, I don't really feel comfortable being on, you know, a, 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 vid a video conference. Um, you know, my parents and my children were all on our, you know, we were talking about this before we started, they were all on our family Seder, you know, multiple screens as everybody was connecting. We're all getting comfortable with new ways of doing things. And that's really good news for gaining trial, um, both among new customers. So people saying, hey, I never tried this. I never thought I'd need this, but now I'm going to sign up, let's say for my Zoom account, but also customers who've been only using a small fraction of features that you offer um, or insisting on using the oldest features and not um, not trying new and better ways so that you can you know more easily sunset the old ways um, suddenly people have more time um, have more need have fewer other options so this is actually a great time uh, for for thinking about new approaches um, at the heart of what I do and the way I look at this is a forever promise. And a forever promise is the reason that your customers decide they're going to trust you, um, that you're going to solve a problem or help them achieve a goal forever, for as long as they have that problem or as long as they want to achieve that goal. Um, for some of you, it might be about entertaining people or helping them be more productive or connecting them to one another, 
or giving them confidence that mundane tasks that they don't enjoy doing are getting done in the easiest and most efficient way so they can focus on higher order needs. Uh, you know, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, at the bottom, uh, physiological needs are met, and then you move up to mitigate risk, to feel a sense of belonging, to be recognized by your peers for your contributions and achievements. Uh, and then finally, you want to be recognized. Um, uh, you want to be allowed to achieve your full potential. You want to, you know, they call it self-actualizing. Um, and businesses that have forever promises that focus on those higher order needs uh, earn the trust of their customers and earn the right to have this forever promise. And um, that's really the forever promise um, is really at the core of what I'm what I'm talking about today. Um, as uh, as Oren said, I oops, um, I, you know my first book. Uh, some of you may have been at the uh, the first event back in I think 2015, um, where I talked about the membership economy, and it was a book I wrote five years ago about subscription models. I had been doing consulting work um, starting in around uh, 2000. To, uh, with Netflix and with SurveyMonkey and uh, Intuit and a whole range of other organizations. And I started seeing the same patterns across these businesses. Um, you know, the recurring re revenue, of course, was the first thing that people see, but also the way that they develop their products. Um, the focus not just on the, um, the trigger benefits or the headline benefits that drive acquisition, but also the engagement and retention features. Um, that guaranteed uh, a long relationship and a high lifetime customer value. Um, a focus on doing one thing really, really well for customers and being willing to continue to evolve the how, the way you deliver it, um, the packaging uh, of the value in terms of different products and different features um, in order to continue to offer your forever promise in the best way possible. And as I... Um, was seeing this and I was trying to explain it to people like, hey, there's this concept, it's the membership economy, any kind of industry can rethink their relationship with their customer by focusing on this forever promise and then iterating on product around that customer's unchanging promise, what it is that they're going to need for the long term and how doing that would justify recurring revenue which resulted in, you know, uh, higher market valuations, uh, somewhere between five and seven X traditional businesses, um, better data, behavioral data, better understanding and insights, um, predictable cash flow. Uh, so I was trying to explain that this was a real thing, that it could apply to any kind of industry, and that the payoff was really big. And people kept saying, no, I don't think that's for me. Uh, I don't really understand how it would work for me. Uh, maybe it works for newspapers or maybe it works for software as a service, but I don't think it works for me. Well, that's why I wrote the book was to say, hey, this is a one pound business card. This explains my point of view. If you find this useful, let's talk. Um, but I'm not gonna try to explain it to you and try to convince you uh, anymore. So that was five years ago. And then, you know, flash forward uh, five years later, everybody's doing it. Um, and uh, I wrote another book, this time not to explain that this was a trend, not to provide the kind of big picture um, of this massive transformation that was happening, but rather to break down the details of how. How do you build a forever transaction with your customer? Um, because people were coming to me and they were saying, okay, I get it. I really want to get the subscription revenue, but I slapped subscription pricing on our existing products and it didn't work. Uh, people canceled after one month. Um, people were paying less and they were cannibalizing our transactional businesses. Uh, you know, all the different reasons, you know, our team doesn't really seem to understand it. You know, people don't like our product. They won't pay for it, whatever the reasons were. And so that's really what this new book is about. And the reason I wrote it is because subscriptions are everywhere. And I just want to take a moment for you to look at this um, really kind of crazy slide. Um, all of the companies featured here, all of the associations, all of the nonprofits um, from, you know, Kepler's in the lower right hand corner, which is um, my neighborhood bookstore. 
um, up to you know big software companies, uh, entertainment companies, caterpillars there, even Burger King. Um, you may not know, but Burger King uh, has its own membership uh, for $5 a month. You get access to uh, coffee every day. And there's lots of really good reasons for that. Um, you know, it brings the customers into the store more regularly, it gets them thinking about Burger King for breakfast. Um, it gets them bringing their colleagues in as well. Um, the cup, you know, most people kind of carry their cup around for a lot of the morning. So it's, you know, more marketing for them. Um, and it's a promise that, you know, whenever you want coffee, stop at a Burger King and you get it with cost certainty. You don't have to pay more. So, you know, everybody's thinking about subscriptions. And there's a lot of great stuff about that. It's a lot easier to know, you know, what is the customer experience? Um, what should it be? There's lots and lots of products uh, and vendors who can support any kind of, you know, subscription billing and CRM and um, digital community and whatever else you need to build a strong forever transaction with your customer. The, the risk here and what's important to remember is that consumers are very sophisticated about subscriptions and they'll tell you what you're supposed to do. They'll say, well, Amazon does this or Spotify does that. And I don't understand why you can't do that. And I don't understand why you only let me cancel Monday through Friday from nine to five, um, as is the case with Hubble contact lenses. Um, but other organizations let me cancel anytime and I only have to pay by the month. So there is this issue right now because there's so many subscriptions of subscription fatigue. And it's caused by three things. One is lack of product market fit. You can't just take a group, a bundle of features and charge a subscription just because those are the features that are available or those are the products that your company happens to make. It has to be optimized around the customer and the product market fit has to extend past that moment of transaction, which is that the fit has to be enough to justify someone buying it, but it also has to justify them staying engaged over time. Second reason um, for subscription fatigue is subscription guilt, which is uh, I pay for this subscription. It's really, really great. I love it so much, um, except that I don't use all of the benefits. And that makes me feel really bad about myself because I'm not using it the way I intended to. Um, and so I'm going to cancel. So in that case, the customer actually says they love the product, but they cancel anyway. So this is what you see with um, uh, the New Yorker is a good example that, that people often talk about where, you know, you're like, oh, the, the subscription, you know, the, the issues keep piling up and, you know, I just feel bad about myself. The price is fine, but I feel bad about myself because it's a constant reminder that I'm not reading highbrow stuff. I'm watching Netflix. Um, and it's also the issue that comes up in gyms where you're like, I never get to the gym. I thought I was going to go every day in January when I signed up, but I really go less than once every two weeks. I should probably cancel. Um, so that's the second thing. And then the third reason for subscription fatigue, um, and I think this is really important and um, it's really emerging right now, is uh, a frustration with subscription businesses. Um, a sense that some of the businesses are, are not, um, are taking advantage of our, of the consumer trust or of the customer's trust. Um, so, uh, I spoke uh, a few months ago for Big Think, and I did a, a video for them, and it was called, and, and they, they snippeted, they made a snippet, and it was called, Are Subscriptions, or Is a Forever Transaction Ethical? And I'll, I'll share that with you um, if you're interested afterwards. And a lot of people posted, I don't think subscriptions are ethical. Um, I don't think that companies should force you to move from a boxed software solution that you own outright to software in the cloud that you have to subscribe to for the rest of your life if you even want to access, you know, the product that you've created with that software. Um, there's a sense of companies that are hiding the cancel button that are talking. And I've, I've heard CEOs of, of venture-backed companies teaching each other that, you know, if you require a more complex cancel, um, uh, cancel scheme, uh, you can get maybe another month or two of revenue out of every customer, um, which sounds really good. You know, here's a way to use, you know, your, um, your UX to extend the relationship with your customer. But if you're doing it by making it really hard for them to end the relationship, that's unethical. So those are the three reasons really um, to be careful of given that subscriptions are everywhere uh, right now. 
Um, this is the core uh, structure of my new book, The Forever Transaction. Um, there's sort of three parts to it. What I, what I wanted to do was help organizations through their maturity uh, as a subscription business. And by the way, the logos on the bottom are case studies that I, use, um, that I used in the, in the book. Um, I tried to get a pretty broad range of you know, B2B and B2C and small and big and high tech and low tech, um, physical products, uh, digital products. Um, so stage one is either you're an entrepreneur and you say, hey, I have an idea for a subscription business. I need to find investors. I need to find my team with the right skills. Um, and I need to make sure I have enough resources um, to get through product market fit and um, you know, figure out what my promise is, who my best member is, and design something. Um, this is also the phase, if you're in a larger organization that is not subscription oriented, this is that phase when there's a little team kind of off in the corner that's trying to figure out SaaS or trying to figure out, you know, a consumer subscription um, while the rest of the company is kind of doing business as usual, almost acting as a little, little startup or a little skunk works. Um, that's the first phase. Um, the challenges there right now um, are mostly about uh, change in priorities. So I've seen a lot of these little teams being told, okay, you know what, we're putting this project on hold. We're not gonna launch. We're gonna wait and see what else happens, but we're gonna put all hands on deck for our core products. Um, that's kind of the, the, the dark side right now um, of being in that launch phase is kind of getting things stopped. Um, it's still a good time for research. It's still a good time for testing and experimenting, but a lot of people are getting pulled off those, those early projects. Uh, second phase scaling is when, um, if you're in a startup, this is when, you know, you get your, you know, next round of funding and you're just blowing the doors off it. You're just trying to grow as quickly as you can. And at the same time, you're trying to build a culture that is going to support this long-term relationship at the same time as you're dealing with, you know, quarterly pressure and pressure to hit your numbers and trying to balance, um, you know, customer centricity with, you know, what I think of as a sales centric approach. Um, it's also the time when you're really trying to figure out what's, what's going to be on your dashboard, what are the right metrics, what should be free in the product, what should the, what should the pricing structure be, should it be tiered, should there be microtransactions, should there be choices, or should there be one simple clean pricing. Um, this is also the time where a lot of organizations are considering an acquisition to speed things up, um, kind of buying the, uh, the expertise and the culture uh, to, to hopefully speed things up. It doesn't always work. Uh, and then the last phase is for those of you that have been in business for a long time, um, I think that the challenges here are um, to stay forever young. So, so what I see happening in businesses that have been around for a long time is they become a victim of their own success. You, you start out, you want to attract these loyal subscribers, you figure it out, you get your product market fit, you scale around this particular group of people and then you listen to them really carefully and you really get to know them with your microscope and you understand this is our best member. Um, I really understand this avatar. Um, I, you know, I understand who he or she is and how they make their decisions. And I could recognize one if they were walking on the street and I talked to them for a minute. Um, and I really continue to tinker with the product to make it perfect for them. And I'm kind of side by side with them but they're not looking with their telescope. So they're not seeing what prospects are looking at, what other choices the prospects have, how they're solving that same problem in very different ways, um, what new technologies are available. Um, I work with a lot of associations in Washington, DC, and a lot of them are still using print magazines and um, fax machines because their members have always done things a certain way and insist on those same processes um, being held consistent. Um, so at, at, in this lead phase, that's a, that's a huge risk. Um, there's a risk of the subscription fatigue as we discussed um, and things are happening on a global level. When I wrote the membership economy, there wasn't as much activity uh, in other parts of the world around subscription pricing. In fact, uh, you know, when I was working with Netflix, uh, they actually, uh, started to, to expand into Europe. They got a foothold in the UK and then they decided to come back and pull back because they didn't feel like Europe was, was ready for this kind of model. So, I mean, that's light years away from, from where we are today. So, um, you know, keeping a focus in this last phase, it's really about, you know, looking out on the horizon and being flexible. And it's actually something that I'm seeing a lot of right now uh, as 
people try to pivot and try to um, connect with this moving target of, of customer need. The other kind of uh, framework that I wanted to share with you um, is this, uh, you know, membership economy seven step um, tool. And what this does is you can go through each of these, you know, you start in the middle and make sure you have your product market fit. And then you tinker around the edges with each of these seven areas. Um, and I'll, I'll go through them quickly. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, the first one is about having the right organization. Um, in, in the membership economy, it's really important that the metrics are shared across functional areas. Um, so for example, you know, one of the things that I've seen is, you know, great product, salespeople sell it, and then people, you know, the, the company doesn't use it, the, comp the purchasing company doesn't use it. So sort of a failure to launch or failure to expand. Um, and sometimes customer success gets blamed for that, but really the issue is, Maybe it's too hard to use, or maybe um, the salesperson um, moved too quickly through the sales cycle and, you know, they focused on the traditional money authority need and uh, desire, and they didn't think about fit for the long term. Uh, and so they got that first payment. So the salesperson, you know, got their goal, but they weren't as focused on making sure that it was set up well for the, the customer lifetime value. Um, Another thing within the organization is thinking about balancing acquisition metrics and revenue targets with engagement metrics, which are really the leading indicator for retention. Um, engagement metrics are things like recency, frequency, depth, and breadth of usage. So recency is when was the last time they used it, frequency is how often do they use it, and um, depth is how long do they spend and how deep do they go in a, in a particular feature? And breadth is how many different features are they using? How broadly are they using it? Um, one kind of interesting uh, point is uh, a lot of the um, media companies that I work with um, that have uh, you know, an OTT, that have an app for uh, video content, uh, one of the first things they wanna do when they onboard a new customer um, the two things that they want to do. The first one is they want to get the customer to connect the app to their smart TV. And the second thing is they want them to use more than one kind of content. So comedies and dramas, rom-coms and documentaries. And the reason for those two things is that they know that if you onboard for those two behaviors, the likelihood of that person having a great experience, getting value for what they're already paying for goes way up. Um, funnel, uh, you know, I'll, I'll skip over that one for now. It's, it's mostly about the idea that uh, the relationship really starts at the moment of transaction. Uh, in the membership economy, the moment of transaction is the starting line for the relationship. And that's where marketing goes deep. That's where the opportunity to expand and deepen the relationship is. And that's where profitability really kicks in. So it's a different kind of funnel that's maybe a little bit more like an hourglass. Um, pricing, uh, I'm pretty sure we'll have a lot of questions on this and I'm glad to take them. Um, you know, in a nutshell, I would say you wanna keep your pricing as simple as you can, but no simpler. And the reason is the more complex your pricing is, the more your customer needs to think about your pricing and the more they have to think about how you're charging them and whether or not it's fair for them, the less they're gonna trust you. So, you know, at the same time as we have these um, billing and pricing tools that allow us tremendous flexibility to experiment, to bundle, to break things down to the tiniest increment, um, we have to balance that. It's kind of like getting that Crayola box of, you know, the 64 crayons and like you wanna use every single one of them and then your picture is a mess and your art teacher says, you know, use a little restraint, you know, you don't, just because you have all the colors, just because you can create any kind of pricing structure you want does not mean that you should have all the bells and whistles in a single offer. Uh, freemium is, uh, you know, I, I think about free trial versus freemium. Free trial is a taste of the best thing you have to offer because they don't understand what it tastes like or because they don't believe it tastes as good as you said. Um, they don't need very long. They just need to say, oh, I understand, or, oh, you're right. Boom. That's all you need from a free trial. Um, freemium is, you know, if, if free trial is filet mignon and a teeny tiny bite, freemium is hamburger for life. Um, it solves the problem, uh, and you never have to pay. 
Uh, so, you know, the only times to use freemium would be either if you're trying to change behavior over time by getting them to see that they're using your product more than they thought they would when they hit the paywall for volume. Uh, second thing is um, if the freemium subscribers are your marketing channel, in other words, they're, it's going viral, they're organically viral, they're the influencers that are making decisions that are going to drive your real revenue. Um, or the third reason is if those freemium members are actually part of the product, which may be if there's a network effect, uh, meaning each new freemium member creates more value for the people who are paying, or if you have an advertising model and you need to gather a lot of eyeballs in order to justify um, your, your, uh, your true customers. Uh, onboarding, we've talked about quite a bit. It's about focusing on those first seconds, minutes, days, after someone joins you to make sure that they're going to stay forever. And this is super important right now. As I talked about earlier, a lot of, um, a lot of companies are seeing a spike in new customers uh, and new subscribers. And there's a huge fear, at least from the product managers that I've talked to, that people are going to come and then they're going to leave when they go back to normal. And so this question is, how do you design your product and your onboarding experience so that even if somebody thought they were just coming for this short term, for this, for this certain period when they might need it, and they plan to go back to their old way of doing things, what can you do to make your products part of their new normal, part of their habits, um, and doing that through your on, onboarding process? Uh, customer success is the flip side of onboarding. Onboarding is uh, making sure that they get value that they're paying for right away and reinforcing their decision. Customer success is continuing to reinforce their decision and continuing to make sure that they're getting value for what they're paying for. If you wait until the customer is ready to cancel before you intervene, um, it's gonna be very hard to save them, uh, hard to win them back. On the other hand, if you track engagement and your customer success team is watching those engagement numbers and intervenes when they see a change in those numbers, uh, you actually have a chance then to, to write things, to make sure that you're solving the problems. And then finally, I don't really need to talk about technology with a team of product managers, but in a lot of organizations, um, whether it's retail or um, news or finance, they're all finding that they're becoming technology companies and they need to think like technology companies, which for many organizations is a very, very different way of, of thinking. So, you know, things are pretty dire right now, um, but I want to remind you that this too shall pass. Um, things always move forward. And the question is where you wanna be when you come out on the other side. Uh, if you focus on quarterly capitalism, if you, you know, focus on hitting your short-term goals uh, at the expense of the relationship with the customer, if you don't invest in building relationships with tomorrow's customers and earning the trust of your existing customers, um, you'll come out on the other side with no brand equity and a really hard row to hoe. Um, when, you, when, you, when you come out on the other side. Um, so for now, uh, what I wanna do is um, you know, encourage you to use both your telescope and your microscope when you're prioritizing uh, your product roadmap. Um, with the microscope, look closely at your best subscribers. What are their challenges and goals right now? Um, how well are your current features and benefits as they've been packaged achieving those goals? And are there new ways that you want to incorporate to solve those, those problems or achieve those goals in a better way? Um, you know, last week I talked to a Latin American grocery store that has historically had longtime traditional shoppers that um, don't want e-commerce. Uh, and guess what? Suddenly they're all, they're all ordering delivery. They're all signing up for their e-commerce account and the company's dealing with this 10X spike in demand um, and suddenly are you know, fast, tracking, um, fast tracking their, their process of, of building their e-commerce footprint. And there's a risk that they don't execute well and they don't take care of these new customers or these existing customers that are moving to a new way of engaging. So it's really important to both stay focused on the people that you've always had, um, but at the same time, 
to look out on the horizon at what's possible. This is actually a great moment to take a step back so that you can see the whole landscape and decide you know, which way you're gonna go uh, for now. Uh, you have a low friction moment right now to change the behavior of longtime subscribers and also a chance to gain trial and establish new habits of engagement from tomorrow's subscribers. Um, so use the goals and objectives of your members as your North Star to guide you through turbulent and uncharted uh, waters. It, it's dark times now, but you can be the ones with the flashlight lighting the way, even if you don't know yet exactly where you're going to end up. Um, to wrap up, uh, the secret to the, uh, the forever transaction is to love your customers and their mission more than any product feature, any person on the team and their preferences, and more than any kind of process or way you've always done things. I have some goodies for you. Um, I'm going to ask Oren to share this, uh, this uh, link, uh, Robbie Kelman Baxter, which is my name, .com slash audience. I have the slides, I have a membership manifesto, and then I'm offering you chapter eight of the new book, which is all about um, building a culture in, in turbulent times and cultures for transformation. So um, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause and we can open it up to, to questions. Great, Robbie. We have about 10 minutes for questions, and we already have a few questions lined up in the Q&A section. Great. Um, so Dave is asking, uh, what is your uh, ballpark uh, guess for percentage of customers who won't buy a subscription for a mobile application that they want um, and can't afford, and, sorry, and can afford just because of the subscription pricing? What is the percent? So of course, I'm going to say it depends um, because it, if, if you have a product that saves my life, then I'm going to pay for it. Um, if you have a product that makes me feel happy when I'm feeling sad, I'm going to figure out how to pay for it. We're seeing that with Peloton. I mean, somehow people are coming up with, you know, 20, whatever is $2,400 for the bike and then 40 bucks a month for the, for the app. Um, and a lot of them are not wealthy. So, you know, it, it's not fair to say that there's a percentage of people who are or are not willing to use subscriptions. I think the average Americans using something like 18 subscriptions at any point in time that they're paying for. So they're using subscriptions. The question is, does your subscription have enough value worth paying for? And I think there's a lot of products that have historically been free, which does two things. One of them is it teaches, it educates consumers that something should be free. Um, when maybe it, it, there's no reason it should be free. It's just, it's been free for a while. So I guess that's what it's supposed to be. Um, and the other thing is that when you give something away for free, people will take, as we all know, if you've ever been to a trade show, you know that if there's something free in front of you, you just take it. And so it's hard to really um, assess demand uh, based on what's free. Uh, there's not necessarily a correlation with what, you know, how many people would be willing to pay even, even one cent for it. Cool. Um, and the next question we have is, uh, what are some of the tips from your re research for subscription products to expand globally and any mistakes to avoid? Um, to expand globally. Um, so there's sort of, I mean, I've seen sort of two parts to this. One of them is that a lot of subscription products, just like this meeting today, they expand, you know, if they're digital only, um, they'll expand really rapidly uh, globally kind of before, a lot of times before you're ready, before you have the currency, before you have the translations, um, you know, and there's sort of challenges around making sure that you're adhering to all the different uh, regulatory requirements and laws by, by country. Um, the other thing to think about, and which is really hard, are the challenges where different countries have different abilities to pay and uh, figuring out the right, the right pricing by market and then also making sure that you're customizing it um, for that market. Those would be those would be some of the things that I would say. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, Dave is asking uh, if a product has a per year subscription price, how long do you think the the free trial period should be? Um, okay, so I, I don't think I don't know that these two things necessarily go hand in hand. So the free trial again should be long enough so that if somebody is saying I don't understand what your product does or I don't believe it does what you say it does. 
those are the two reasons to have a free trial. If you don't need, to, if, if those are not your problems, if you say to yourself, what are the reasons that people aren't subscribing? If it's not those two reasons, they don't understand or they don't believe me, um, don't give away free trial. I see companies all the time doing a free trial because they think that's something that they could do to drive usage. Um, freemium, on the other hand, is something if you want to change behavior. Um, and then the second part of the question was, if you have an annual price. So there's, there's a lot of, you know, nuance about monthly versus annual pricing. Um, there are some good reasons to do annual pricing. Um, Netflix has always been monthly and I'm sure I think Gibson spoke and, you know, probably talked about how, you know, Netflix has always been monthly and you can't buy it annually. You can't subscribe annually. Um, but for a lot of organizations, it, allows you to reward people who are more committed. So again, if you're focusing on a lifetime relationship with somebody, uh, you should reward the ones that are ready to commit, that are saying, you know, I'm likely to be here for the, for the long term. Um, so, you know, I see a lot of organizations saying, you know, if the monthly price is, you know, $10 a month, you might have the annual subscription be somewhere between 80 and $100, right? So, um, you know, you reward them for their, for their commitment. Um, sometimes you do an annual price because, um, because there's a lot of onboarding uh, that's required. Either, you know, you need physical product, you need customization, you need training in order for the person to get up to speed. And so you say, well, look, we're just going to require that you, that you do the first year um, so that we don't lose, lose our money. Or you're worried about a smash and grab. So I know a lot of um, content companies have this issue where, uh, you know, somebody signs up they watch the, um, the all-star game uh, during their free trial period or during their first week and then they cancel. So they never intended to stay and they got the big chunk of value uh, either in the trial or in that first month. So a lot of companies are like, no, we don't want to allow, we have to structure our offering to protect ourselves against those kinds of um, use cases. Um, it's also true when it's early on and you might be worried about you know, cannibalization uh, having an annual fee is a way of sort of protecting the organization. Um, the downside is you don't then get to see how many months somebody stays if they have complete flexibility. Um, but I don't think that, you know, the number of weeks of trial ties in with the annual price. Um, they're kind of, they're, they're, they're different tactics, different elements of a pricing structure. Um, and you may or may not use both of them together. I, I always forget. I, I end up paying a month for the one game. Um, the next question <laughs> is, uh, some companies are providing free access during this pandemic. Is this a good long-term strategy? So it's, it's interesting. This morning, I was talking to a group of um, newspaper publishers from all around the world. And this is like very hotly debated because in the United States, um, almost every newspaper is giving away all COVID-19 related content. And they have different ideas of what that means. Does that include the financial news um, that's tied to the, to the pandemic or is it just health related? Um, and the, the kind of mindset here is that that's the ethical choice. Um, that's the neighborly choice. You know, the business roundtable recently, um, you know, for years and years, uh, the largest companies in the world were focused on shareholder value. And last year they signed a new statement, which was about stakeholder value, which was really about shareholders plus customers, plus employees, plus the community. So there's, that's kind of the zeitgeist that we're in here um, that, you know, we need to take care of our neighbors, um, generosity that certainly aligns with a focus on the long term. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think a lot of companies that are kind of loosening their paywalls right now um, are doing it in a not very thoughtful way. So really being clear on whether you're doing it for business reasons, you know, trial, changing behavior, um, awareness, goodwill, or if you're doing it truly out of a sense of kind of ethics, obligation, uh, generosity, and then focusing whatever you're giving away on giving it to the right people. In Europe and in other parts of the world, there's this idea